from ma uh, making a pauses or any audible responses until the end of the event. The event will be strictly in English. Uh, so with that, without further ado, let's start with the uh, opening statements by the candidates. Uh, we, each candidate will have uh, a minute and a half, and we'll start with uh, Senator Cardinal. Thank you very much for the invitation to appear at this forum. I have been in the Senate for 36 years. Before that, I was mayor of Demarest for four years and six years on the Board of Education. I am running so that my experience will keep our district a safe place to live, to raise a family, a place with good schools for our children, our grandchildren to attend, and to keep taxes from rising at the rate they used to rise. In the last eight years, property taxes have gone up, but they've only gone up 16% for the whole eight years. But the eight years before that, under Democratic Governor Corzine and McGreevy and Cody, they went up 60%, not 16, 60% in an eight year period. The Democrat platform brags that it will raise taxes. It does not support the 2% tax cap. It will make our state safe for criminals like M13 gang members and drug pushers. It will bring force over development to our towns, which will bring traffic, crime, and overcrowd our schools. And it will raise taxes. I know this, is, uh, I apologize because I had oral surgery, so uh, before you tie me, if you can't hear me, um, I apologize again. Are we ready now? Ayan Haseo. I know it's supposed to be in English, but I've been learning some Korean as we're going on the campaign trail. Um, thank you to Case and to Sangwan Jung, program director, as the moderator, thank you for inviting us. And again, I apologize for me. My name is Linda Schwager, and I am a candidate for state senate, and I am running with Janie Chung and Annie Hausman. I am running because I know we in District 39 need our voices heard in Trenton. We are not heard. I am an independent thinker. I know the incumbents are trying to lump us in with the Democratic shell because they have been voting as a Republican under the a Republican tent. We, the three of us, are very independent thinkers and I will owe nobody anything once elected. The current representatives have been in Trenton uh, for a very long time. The state senator has been there, as you heard, for 35 years. We need fresh ideas and new eyes looking forward to what is happening. I promise you that I will advocate for all residents in our district. I have experience in government, serving as mayor, councilwoman, planning board, and on the zoning board. And I will bring fresh ideas and independence. It's time for a change from this district. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next, we have Mr. Tassone, the Libertarian candidate. Good evening, I'm Jim Tassone, the Libertarian Party's candidate for Senate. My grandparents came to America in the early 1900s to escape the grinding poverty of Southern Italy. They brought with them a culture where problems were solved and opportunities were created by working voluntarily with family, friends, neighbors, and mutual aid societies in their communities. To them, government's primary role was to protect their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet the more the two traditional parties have used government to intervene in business, education, health care, and transportation, the worse things have gotten. 45% of the voters in District 39 are registered as unaffiliated. They are the politically homeless and are tired of hearing the two traditional parties promise to reform programs 
to control spending and to reduce taxes. In this Senate race, the politically homeless have a third choice. I will tackle the reforms needed to the big ticket spending items in the state budget, and I will use the savings to reduce state taxes and debt. Good evening. Uh, uh, thank you, Song, for being the moderator this evening. Uh, I have uh, a lifetime of experience in northern Bergen County. My parents moved from New York City to New Jersey as an oasis, away from high taxes, bad schools, and they came to New Jersey for low taxes, no income tax, low property taxes, and great schools, and a place that kids could grow up in safety in the backyard and play with their other friends. They, they didn't have to be in uh, parks that were supplied by the city or anything of that nature. Um, I am ex extremely surprised at the naivete, naivete of, uh, of our, our opponents because they have said that they are independent thinkers, yet their campaign has been ostensibly funded by PAC money sent in by uh, Speaker Vincent Prieto. And it's absolutely, I'm incredulous that they actually believe that if they have promised to raise taxes $1.3 billion, that they've promised to fully fund the school funding formula at $9 billion, where 30% of that money will come from Burton County, and we will receive probably $330 million back. That's crumbs for what we'll be paying in. They promised to increase transportation spending by $3 billion. They promised free college, all while promising to lower your property taxes. Yet they're going to tell you that when they need the votes to do this, that Vincent Prieto, who spent all the money to get them here, will not tell them to how they have to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilwoman Janie Chung. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you to CASE for organizing this public forum. But special thanks for bringing me back to my high school today. I also want to thank everyone who's taken their time out on a Friday evening to be here. My name is Janie Chung. I'm a daughter of Korean immigrants who came to this country in 1977, the same year I was born. Please don't do the math. My mother's first job was working on a in a factory on an assembly line, putting dials on radios while pregnant with me. My father's first job was washing dishes. They had no family, friends, or community. All they had was hard work, determination, and hope. But because of their hard work today, I now have family, friends, and a community. My parents chose to fulfill their American dream by becoming small business owners. This meant our entire family was all in. I spent my life participating in the joys and struggles of entrepreneurship. Because of these real world life experiences, I have a unique perspective and understanding of the challenges facing small businesses in New Jersey. I hope to share with you some of my insight tonight. I'm currently a proud councilwoman in Closer, and this year I am running for a state assembly so that I can represent you and fight for growing our economy, lowering taxes, and protecting our most vulnerable. I am honored and excited to be here tonight to share with you some of my ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Next Assemblywoman, Holly Shapisi. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you to CASE. Uh, we've had the opportunity of appearing with CASE uh, over the years, and it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a businesswoman, and I'm a lawyer. I um, have a daughter who just started her freshman year of high school and a son who just started his first grade year. I grew up in Bergen County as a child of a first-generation Italian. He was the first person in his entire family ever to be educated. I'm the first female in my entire extended family ever to go to college. We lived in Fort Lee, we realized the American dream, and we moved up to the country, Pascack Valley area. I went to college in DC, worked in London, went to Fordham Law School, came out, and spent many years working night and day to be who I am today. When my daughter, who's now 14, was a couple of months old, we found out she was ill. It was the year I was up for partnership. Sometimes in life, you have to take care of your own family first. 
I gave up that opportunity. I came home, I started my own law practice and became a small business owner with a sick baby at my side. Here I am all these years later as your state assemblywoman fighting for small business, fighting for education, and fighting for women who have found the same paths that I have. Thank you. Thank you. And last time, but not least, uh, Ms. Hausman. Hi, Anyang Haseyo. Thank you very much for having me. I too am learning. Um, my name is Annie Hausman. I've been a resident of Bergen County for 23 years. I moved here with my husband, David. We're married 23 years, and we have two children, Jack and Georgia, both in college. Um, both went to school right up the street at the sister school, Old Japan. Um, so first, I just want to address um, part of my platform. You know, I think we really need to look at the tax problem up here. I think we can all agree on that. But we need to keep our values in line. Um, it is a shame that Bergen County is no longer a place where young families can afford to live, where seniors can no longer afford to stay in communities that they built. Um, so I have not made any promises to raise or lower taxes or support gangs or drug pushers or all of the boogeymen that is talked about in all of the parties, you know, here on the national stage. This divisive behavior just doesn't work. Um, it has been proven. We need to be able to sit at a table and compromise, like we see it over and over again every single day. I've been a lifelong advocate for at-risk and minority portions of the population. I've devoted my life in Bergen County from the PTO. I um, had the Korean Parent Association handbook translated into English. We became one unit. Um, I have successfully accomplished a lot as a volunteer in this community, oh, and I would like to question. represent you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kastner. Okay, uh, now we'll now head into the six questions that we have prepared for all seven candidates. Uh, for each question, uh, we're gonna alternate our turns to speak, and each candidate uh, will have one minute to uh, address uh, the questions asked. Uh, the first question is, uh, I'm sure is of uh, everybody's primary concern, local economy. This is actually a three-part question, so bear with me while I go through the uh, list. Uh, first, what is your plan to help our local economy thrive in the district? And number two, at 70%, Korean Americans have the highest share of businesses with four or fewer employees from all race and ethnicities. The national average is 62%, and for Korean Americans, it's 70%. Um, so do you have any personal experience or expertise in working with small businesses especially in the current economic climate. Um, and the statistics show that most uh, small businesses are family, um, family owned and operated, and uh, most of the owners are also workers themselves. And last part, uh, we've lost corporate headquarters in the district uh, in 2013 Hertz, 2015 Mercedes. Um, so do your, do your plans include attracting and retaining any large corporations as such? Uh, for this question, we will start with uh, Mayor Schrader. Thank you. Well, I do have experience with small businesses because right now I do own a small business. I am a lawyer um, since graduating from law school. And that, that's another story. I went to law school when I was in my 40s. It was a dream come true. I had the opportunity to go to law school and my three sons were in middle school and high school, and I commuted to New York every day for three years to become a lawyer. I would come home, do homework, and so would my sons. Um, and so now they have a very good work ethic. But I always say, if you want to do something, you can do it. But before I was a lawyer, I was a small business owner. I owned a party store in Oakland, and I was the chief, a former, I previously was the president of the Chamber of Commerce of Oakland. So I do know what businesses need, small businesses. I'm an employer. I know about paying taxes. I know about paying employees. I know about scheduling employees. And I know what it's like to juggle owning a business and having a family. I see fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tassel? I've worked in my father's small electrical contracting business for a Fortune 50 company and currently in my own one-person company. First, 
we need to end all special subsidies, exemptions, loopholes, and tax breaks to politically connected companies. If you have to bribe a company to move here or stay, they will leave when another county or state offers them a better deal. Second, we need to simplify the business tax code by treating all income the same and eliminating deductions so we can lower the associated property uh, business tax rates. Dealing with record keeping and audits is almost as painful as actually paying the taxes. Finally, we need to systematically review all business laws and regulations. We will keep only those which are there for which there is actual evidence that the law or regulation directly protects the health and safety of workers, customers, and the public. Thank you. And Senator Cordinale? I am the owner of a small business. It's a dental practice. But that's not the only small business, and that's since 1960. It's not the only small business that I <coughs> operated. I built a shopping center in Fort Lee, and as a result of that, I operated an ice cream parlor, a bridal shop, an art gallery, a men's store. Uh, at one point, for a short time, I even operated a jewelry store. I know firsthand the problems of running a small business. There is too much government regulation. There is too much government coming in and taking a part of your income and making it very difficult for small businesses to survive. And the democratic plan is to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And you know what? That will stop many small businesses from being able to survive but what is so ridiculous about this is the workers in their campaigns, they don't pay them $15 an hour. They pay them much less. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll go to Councilwoman Jane Chung. So I believe that in order to grow the economy, we have to pay special focus to the small business sector. There are typically four barriers for small businesses. Capital is one. That's usually the biggest one. Small businesses often need money to expand or open or to hire um, new employees. And banks have become increasingly tough to get loans from. We need to work on diminishing the gap between what the businesses are asking for and what they're actually receiving. The second one is regulations. They're too burdensome for our small businesses. <coughs> They need to be simple, they need to be streamlined and more transparent. The third is technology. With the increase of technology, businesses are having a hard time following suit and keeping up and training their employees and training the owners. And we need to focus on better training programs to keep up with technology. And the last is workforce. Um, I see my time's over, so I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Excuse me. So my husband's a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. I owned a private equity group that actually provided capital to small businesses. As an assemblywoman in New Jersey, I've had to say no to some very tough policies that have been put forth by the Democrats, including $15 per hour minimum wage with no exemption for anybody, including teenage workers or interns. Mandatory paid family leave for small businesses, regardless of the size of your business and regardless of whether or not you can afford it. Uh, they now are trying to mandate that your employees can pick their own hours of operation, regardless of how small your business is. Now, I find you know the Democratic platform right now is bad for small business. Regulations are too burdensome. Unfortunately, our opponents just accepted today $243,000 towards their campaign from an organization that is fighting for socialist policies that will destroy small yeah, business in New Jersey. Up. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hausman? I have no idea. Um, thank you. Um, so I've had every job. Um, I've delivered papers. I've done everything. My husband runs a small business in Northvale. It's a factory. They manufacture medical and athletic training equipment. He actually donated both athletic training rooms to the high schools. Um, he has roughly 90 employees. 
They are paid a living wage. They have a union. The company pays 60 to 80 percent of the health care. They have a cash bonus, deferred profit sharings, and a 401k with matching. And the employees are treated fairly, respected, have incentives, and in turn, they never leave. The 25-year club is coming up next month, and there will be 30 employees in attendance. So, you know, that is proof that it works. I, um, it is all connected at the end of the day. Businesses do not want to move to a state that has crumbling infrastructure, high tolls for subpar transportation, along with the highest property taxes in the nation, which have risen 17% in the last eight years under Christie and his dream team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is also on small small business. This one was actually uh, submitted by one of our co-sponsors, uh, the Mail Business Association. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I am so sorry. It's okay. Mr. Roth. Oh, you don't get to speak? I was being nervous. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to worry. Um, the question was what I plan to do to advance small business. One of the first votes I cast, along with my colleagues, was a vote against the 15% tax, mm -hmm. corporate tax increase. This vote was cast in the assembly right at the time when Mercedes was planning to leave and go to Georgia, when Hertz car rental in Park Ridge packed up and left the state, and several other companies in that area, so that there are now vacant corporate parks. That's what we're doing right now. We're doing voting against bills that are being supported and advanced by the person that's funding their campaign, Vincent Prieto, and holding him in check at any time possible. So it's between the Republican legislature and the veto pen of the governor that's protecting small business in this state at the current time. They want to change that and have a total monopoly. That will be deleterious for businesses in New Jersey. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, which was submitted by the Nail Business Association of New Jersey. Uh, regulation on nail salon workers license abruptly changed in 2014. Since then, the requirements to obtain the license have greatly increased. With the higher barrier to entry, the industry has been losing workforce. What do you plan to do to help such small businesses? Uh, with this question, we will start with Mr. Tassan. For nearly 30 years, I have been a big supporter of the Institute for Justice. They have been successfully leading the fight against unnecessary and unjust occupational licensing requirements. While the general public is told that increased licensing requirements are for the protection of workers and the public, we know full well that most are designed to restrict competition, raise prices on the consumer, and expand the power of elected officials and government bureaucrats. If I have the privilege to represent you in Trenton, you will have no louder voice for your right to be free to earn an honest living in the profession of your choosing without unnecessarily burdensome occupational licensing requirements. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cardinale. For 10 years, 12 years, I was the chairman of the Commerce Committee in the Senate. Now, we were told that New Jersey has six thousand different kinds of licenses of one or another type. In my 12 years, I never allowed one bill to go through that committee that established a new licensing requirement. There were a few things where we got certifications, but never a new licensing requirement. New licensing requirements are a tool, a tool of special interests to keep people out of doing occupations for which they are very qualified. It should be the qualification of the individual, how they serve their customers, not whether they meet some uh, licensing board, whether they can uh, go before a, a, a test of some sort. The customer is your test. And if you are not good at your job, the customer will not come back. Well, thank you. Um, the question I was, I was, um, I focused in that it was submitted by the Nail Business Association. And um, I frequent a nail business very often. I am also an attorney for a nail business in Oakland, and I help them whenever they have any kind of legal problems. 
with requirements, with licensing, et cetera. To me, the most paramount idea and, and, and what is most important is the health of the customer. And again, I'm dealing with the nail business because that's what I assumed the question was really geared to. As long as the health and welfare of the customer is paramount, then that is the key to this whole thing. Thank you, uh, Ms. Spiesi. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of spare time to get my nails done on a regular basis, as you can see. My 14-year-old daughter goes quite a bit, but um, while I've been in office, as a small business proponent, I have been an advocate for trying to peel back layers of unnecessary red tape. Yes, health, safety, welfare of you know, both the workers as well as the consumers is very important, but oftentimes in New Jersey, we unnecessarily put licensing in place that doesn't have any sort of real um, impact other than to make it difficult for entry into a marketplace. One of the biggest issues for the nail salon owners that you must keep your eyes on is this push towards the $15 minimum wage as well as being able to have your employees mandate their own hours of when they come to work. Those are two major conditions, two major issues that they want no exemptions on on the Democratic Party. Thank you. So thank you. Ms. Housman. Hi, thank you. Um, so I would say that employees and jobs are priorities, um, no matter what the sector. We need to find a way that emphasizes fairness to employees to make them happy so they want to come here and work. Um, oftentimes regulations put in place um, become a double-edged sword. You know, we need to find a balance between safety, protecting human rights, but also to make sure law-abiding nail salons have an environment that works for them, um, that does not bleed the business dry. These mom and pop businesses, we need to fight to keep them here, um, not make it impossible. I agree with that. Um, you say there are 60 different types of licenses between you. You have 50 years experience. Like, what have you done? So I say that um, we have to make it so it is not impossible to stay here in New Jersey and keep our jobs here. Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you. Yes, we've had uh, 60 years of experience. And what I've done since I've been in the legislature is to vote no against every attempt to create new licensure within the state. We have to remember this. Not only nail salons, if that seems to be the subject of du jour, but every small business where they require this licensure type thing, they also then have a cottage industry of continuing education credits, which also go along. It becomes, one, a mandated tax on small business, unfunded. The second thing it does is it creates uh, time that's taken away from the business by the people that are quote unquote licensed, where they have to go and take CE credits. So that's more time away from the business that the business owner, and more times than not, has to pay. So it's just another added expense, another layer of regulation that does absolutely nothing to protect the general public. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Chung? We have to prioritize the highest standards for uh, consumer and employee protections. There's no business owner that I know of that wants to risk the health and safety of their employees and their customers. Having said that, oftentimes these businesses are overregulated and unnecessarily burdened by these kinds of licensure requirements. I think we have to look at the goal and we have to look backwards. What is the reason for licensing? What is the reason for these regulations? And how, we, how can we simplify and streamline to get there? I think that the purpose of having license requirements and regulations are not necessarily bad ones, but it's the process that brings down the business owners. So I think that we do need to streamline and simplify the process to get to the goal that we all want, which is the safety of everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll move on to the questions on education. Uh, as, you, as we all know, District 39 is home to some of the best public uh, schools in the state. Uh, and what are your plans to ensure that our schools maintain their advanced standings 
and that all students in all our school districts have access to a high level of education and all services that they may need. Uh, with this question, we're going to start with Senator Cardinale. Thank you. I value good schools. I'm very proud of the schools in the 39th Legislative District. They're all good schools. I served for six years on the Demarest Board of Education because I believe that good schools are not only good for educational purposes, but they're good for the economy. We have a very well-trained, very literate workforce in New Jersey, and it's because we have these good schools. But there is a problem. And the problem is that we get shortchanged. This has been going on for 40, 50 years, that our schools get shortchanged because the educational formula discriminates against the 39th district and all suburban towns. Now, I supported, didn't pass, but I supported a different formula, one that has the money follow the child, not the zip code. If we did that, we would have better schools and we would have lower property taxes. Thank you, Senator. We have uh, Ms. Schrager. Yes. Um, children are our most important goal is to take care of our children and our schools take care of our children do you know that when you when you pay your property taxes approximately 70 percent 75 percent of the municipal taxes you pay go to the schools that's where the taxes are it's funding high taxes but we need good schools and it is very important to keep good schools because if you don't have good schools your houses don't sell and the market of your houses go down it's very important and as has been said the school funding formula has been going on and on they've tried to submit bills it doesn't get even it doesn't go anywhere you need someone who can work both sides of the aisle to get certain bills passed thank you mr Casson. It is true that relative to other traditional public schools, ours are very good. But I believe they can be even better and at a much lower cost. 37% of the state budget goes to public schools, and that's on top of the two-thirds of our property taxes. That's because there is little choice and competition in K through 12 schools. I support charter schools, private schools, vouchers, and backpack funding. Study, this puts more of the decision making back in the hands of parents and students. Studies show that even good performing traditional public schools like those in our district get even better when parents and children have real choices. And I would allocate state level school funding equally among students which would benefit District 39. Thank you. Ms. Houseman. Thank you. Um, so both of my kids went to this high school, and um, it's a really good school. We're really fortunate. Um, our local high school actually, Old Town, just qualified as future ready due to large improvements in the curriculum, um, adding STEM, more AP and honors classes. They added coding, something they didn't have three years ago when my son graduated, which was problematic because he was um, applying to engineering school. So I'm so happy that the school has taken these steps towards enriching and expanding the opportunities that will be available to them upon graduation and thus the college application process. Again, we must stop pointing fingers. Education is the most important thing. Our children are our greatest assets. They are the future. So um, that will be a priority for me. I would like to sit down like adults and have a conversation of what the problem actually is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roth? Do you see how they don't want to talk about the real issue? The real issue is $9 billion for CFA funding formula that will rob Bergen County schools. They want to spend $9 million, 30%. Nine billion, excuse me, thank you. Nine billion dollars, 30% of that money will be coming from Bergen County and we will get crumbs back from the state for the expenditure we will make. This is their constant 
objective, to obfuscate what the real, from the real problem, and the real problem is the head of their party, their gubernatorial candidate, has laid out a plan that's going to extract money from our district for the express purpose of funding other schools other than Bergen County Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Chung? The question being how to maintain the high level of ed education we currently have in this district. I went to school here and I probably most of us have moved into this district because we know the education system is top notch. I want to take a little bit of a different approach. I believe that the way to maintain the standard that we have and improve upon it is to invest in our teachers. You can have the best building, you can have the best technology and the best resources. If you don't have good teachers, your standard of education will go down. Our teachers are not making the money that they used to. They have less in their pockets because of medical insurance costs are rising. Their pensions are at risk. And because of this, we're not attracting quality teachers, quality educators. So I think our focus should be on how do we support our teachers and how do we get the best teachers, the most qualified ones, come to this district to work and educate our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peavy. One of the biggest issues for education happens to be actually the NJEA, which represents the teachers. They have promulgated policy for the past 30 years to stop any sort of change to benefit teachers or students in the classrooms. Bergen County is the largest county in the state. We receive, as a county, proportionately one of the least amounts of funding. This school district alone receives less than $750 per student to go to school per year out of your tax dollars that go to Trenton. That is because of democratic policy and that's because of the NJEA. Comparable schools around the state are receiving $30,000 per child that gets wasted, that never goes into the classroom. We must change the educational funding formula in this state. And that is something that I have sponsored legislation on. It is something I fight towards. And it's one of the reasons why my opponents were endorsed by the very organization that doesn't want us to get any money. Thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate the passion on this topic, as it's uh, close to uh, this issue, close to my heart, too. Um, we have actually another question on this topic, as uh, submitted by the Korean Parents Association uh, here at Northern Valley Demarest. Um, their concern is primarily on college affordability. Each year, 31,000 uh, <coughs> high school students or graduating seniors head out, out of state for college, and that's more than half of each year's graduating uh, high school senior class. Um, and even though many families would like to attend colleges here at home, uh, many cite the reason for leaving out of state is the steep education, the steep education cost uh, in state even with the in-state rates. So uh, how do you plan on addressing the college affordability and, and retaining uh, the so-called brain drain? Uh, with this question, we're gonna start with Ms. Uh, Schwager. Yes, we have to make the colleges more affordable. That's the bottom line. And if it means the state has to help with student loans, then the state has to help with student loans. Um, as an attorney, I've, I've worked with people who have not been able to repay their student loans their credit was shot, there has to be a way for the legislature to come to grasp, uh, to grasp this, I'm sorry. Um, New Jersey is the fourth highest in tuition costs for a four year, for a four year school. That's amazing. We're the fourth highest in the country. Something has to be done. Thank you, Mr. Tassone. The conventional wisdom is that we need subsidized student loans because college tuition is so high. The fact is, college tuition is so high because of government subsidized student loans. Studies show that for every $1 increase in student loan subsidies and guarantees, colleges raise tuition by 66 cents and cut back on their own loan programs and free community college tuition will only make the problem worse. It will further distort the decision-making of people who might otherwise opt for non-college options, like computer coding camps, apprentice programs, and company-provided on-the-job training, 
all of which can provide people with the skills for well-paying jobs at a modest cost. Thank you. Senator Fortinelli. College tuition is too high. We all know that. Bergen Community College, it's a two-year college, they charge $4,000 a year for a student. Their total cost, they get a subsidy, their total cost is $6,000. That's less than most of our grammar schools. What is the secret of making tuition less, is making it cost less for the college? So I asked the question, how can you do this? How can you do this for $6,000 a year? And you know what the answer is? We spend our money in the classroom. Why do we not in our public schools spend the money in the classroom? Because of the teachers union. The teachers union destroyed education in New Jersey because they made it so expensive that the people can't afford to live here anymore. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Alt? Well, I've heard a lot of good answers on this particular question. But I would say, if I was going to identify one thing that I thought would be uh, worth our attention, it would be a robust uh, application of the STARS program in New Jersey, which has our uh, stu high school students start off in a community college for the first two years of rudimentary or even remedial in some cases, uh, work coursework that they need to take. And at that point, if they perform admirably, they can be guaranteed a seat in the state colleges, which is a program that's currently in effect. Um, I have had discussions with members of uh, Rutgers University, for example, who tell us that the students do not come to the colleges prepared for the coursework that's going to be assigned to them. So. Two things need to, put, need to take place. One, that they need to be prepared so where, where they're lacking in high school, that has to be remedied. And two, we need to put more acc accentuation on the STARS program so people can get into a community-based college, get the rudimentary work out of the way, and then take advanced studies in the state school. Thank you. And Ms. Halsey? Hi, thank you. Um, so did you know that kids from New Jersey who go out of state to college do not come back at five times the national average? And I think that's low. Um, and there's a reason for this. Um, my son goes to school in Austin, Texas. 87% of his freshman class was from Austin, uh, was from Texas, excuse me. Why? Um, it's a really good school. But it did not get that way because the kids are smarter. You know, the state worked tirelessly to make that happen. They keep their best and their brightest. It took a long time. Um, and it comes down to priorities. The reason kids go out of state is the high cost of public universities here. Um, and we have to better tailor our educational choices to the student. You know, we try and fit the kids into molds of what we think they're supposed to be. There are lots of options. I see a stop, so. Mr. Um, one clarification from before on teachers being appropriately paid. Right now, the teachers at the school, on average, are being paid $100,000 a year. So we are very generous with many of our teachers. One of the issues with our state schools is state spending. Take Rutgers by way of example. There are two professors at Rutgers whose claim to fame is that they put forth the thesis that if you own pets, you're equivalent to a slave owner. They make $600,000 a year. So that's driving a lot of the cost. But I propose public-private partnerships between our schools and our um, employees and employers in the state where if a student graduates NJIT or Stevens, works for an incubator, works for a company, there are loan forgiveness programs through tax rebates for that company. You stay in the state, you get a job, and if you stay and work in the state for a couple of years, odds are you're staying in the state forever. So we're looking at innovative programs to do that. Thank you. Ms. Chong? It goes without saying that college tuition fees have gotten out of hand, and we need to do something to make it affordable for students. Many students leave because 
out-of-state tuition at other universities are pretty close to our in-state tuition. There's a problem there. I think our focus needs to be on the creation of not just affordability, but the creation of jobs. Another reason why students leave is because they go to colleges in areas in which they want to start their life and they want to work. Because we don't have jobs here, and we don't have jobs that are attractive to them. I actually like Assemblywoman Shapizi's idea of incubating students by offering um, a break on student loan forgiveness if they stay here, because I think that is what we need to do. I think we need to encourage students not only to attend university here, but to stay here, to grow their family here, to have a life and an, an extended life here. And in that way, we can entice students, we can entice students to stay in state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to Next, move on to the issue of senior citizens' welfare, uh, even though as much as I would like to hear more on, on this issue, I appreciate the uh, consensus. Uh, according to the 2015 American Community Survey, District 39 um, has up to 23% of the uh, population here in District 39 is aged 60 or older, uh, which is a significant portion. Uh, in the state legislature, how do you plan to ensure that our senior citizens enjoy a safe and sound life? And do your policies include any plans regarding social security, senior housing, and or other benefits and services? Uh, for this question, we're going to start with Mr. Tassam. With regard to safety of senior citizens, the good news is that thanks to business and technology, there has never been a safer time in history to be a senior. As for senior housing, we need to do things that make housing more affordable for everyone. The private sector can build affordable houses. The total price of putting up a house is high in part because of the many regulations that do nothing to protect the health and safety of owners, renters, or communities. Let's fix that. Finally, the state legislature and the courts have spent the last 20 years interfering in the housing and land use decisions of local communities. They've made a complete mess of it, and it's time to return control to local communities. Thank you. Senator Cordinelli. Property taxes are driving many seniors out of our area. When I was mayor, this man who had been on our planning board for 40 years, I asked him, did he want to be reappointed? He said, no. I can't afford the property taxes. Now, he helped create our whole community. But he couldn't afford, he could see the future. He had a good pension, he was retired, but he couldn't afford the property taxes anymore. So when I got into the legislature, I proposed a bill, senior citizen tax freeze. Now, the way I proposed the bill, it would have helped a lot of seniors in the 39th district. But unfortunately, on the way to passing, and it did pass eventually, it got amended and amended and amended so that there is a means test. And the means test is so low that most of the people in the 39th district can't pass the means test. It is a good deal for a town to keep its senior citizens in their home. They don't lose money if they give them a tax freeze. We have wonderful senior citizens in Oakland, and we have a fabulous senior citizen center with a lot of activities. We take care of our seniors in Oakland, but unfortunately, many of them come up to me and say, I can't live here anymore, I can't afford it. And we're trying to get affordable housing in Oakland for seniors, but you need to have a location. We found a location in the middle of our town within walking distance to the first aid building, police station, and our senior citizen center, but we don't have enough land to build and, and per the requirements as stated. We have to help our seniors until we can get that affordable housing for the seniors. We need them to stay. Uh, we need them to work with the young children. We have many activities where high school students and seniors work together, and they each help each other. The young people learn about the seniors, and the seniors can give their expertise and their lifelong experience to the children. We need to keep them here. Thank you. Ms. Houseman. 
Thank you. As I said in my opening statement, it is a sad state of affairs when our seniors can't stay in the communities that they helped build. Um, however, it is an astonishing truth. Um, it's the number one issue I hear about when I talk to residents when I walk. Um, their pensions have been pilfered with no relief in sight, and I can't only blame Christy. It was Corazon before him and Whitman before her before him. I speak to folks every day who are retiring, teachers, law enforcement, and they're afraid. They're afraid that they will not receive the benefits they were promised. We made promises to our public servants. We have to keep those promises. I don't know what happens moving forward after that. The financial instability of this state is disastrous. Legislation like the Homestead Benefit and the Senior Tax Free should be reinstated. We must honor the wisest sector of our communities. They, lay out, they laid the foundation for us and should get what they deserve. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keezy. Most of our seniors, regardless of whether or not they were public employees, live on a fixed income, or they're struggling to make ends meet as they continue to work into their older years. We have a lot of policies in this state that have made it incredibly difficult for seniors to stay. Number one is property taxes. Many seniors would be able to afford their homes if their property taxes haven't skyrocketed over the past two decades. So some of the programs that I've been working on include phasing down the school portion of your senior property tax, helping enable aging in place programs for seniors by working in conjunction with groups like Meals on Wheels, Bayada Health, and a whole host of other organizations. And one of the most important things and nonsensical things for affordable housing in our communities, there's an artificial cap that the state has placed saying that you can't build more than 25% of affordable housing and get credit for it for your seniors. You're also not permitted to give preference to the seniors in your own community who have lived there for their entire lives. Thank you, Mr. Pizzi. I'm changing that. Thank you. Ms. Chompton? <laughs> Affordability is a big issue for seniors. It's the number one issue. I think we need to work with the municipalities. Um, I think we need to incentivize the municipalities to encourage them to build more senior housing that's affordable. Now, as a councilwoman, I'll tell you firsthand, as, and as a town representative, we, you know, it's hard for us to think about building senior housing because we just don't get enough credits for it. And we are held prisoner to the number of credit and units that we have to build. I think that we should encourage municipalities to engage in shared services. We have a lot of small towns. And a lot of times, these individual towns can't offer senior services. But together, if three or four towns do it together, we can provide a lot of great services for them. I think that we should also look into ways to manage their property tax burden, and also ways to lessen the burden of fees, such as motor vehicle fees that are routine. Um, OK, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a very important question to me. My parents moved from the house that I live in now and moved to South Jersey to get relief from property tax. And what they've done is they've stolen time from my son to interact with his grandfather. I know many people in this room cherish the opportunity for their children to interact with the grandparents because they impart such great knowledge. I'm half the man my father was, and I wanted my son to have more opportunity, more opportunity to speak with his grandfather and to understand things that my grand, his father, his grandfather, my father could impart to him. The way I want to handle this is twofold. I want to one revisit Senator Cardinale's bill and get the means test out of that bill so that we can let seniors live there. And I want to institute some of the policies that Assemblywoman Trapezi has outlined. Both people have thought this out along with us in, in several different meetings, and we have a plan that would Thank address you. this handily. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, we are now moving on to our uh, the last question of the night. Um, but may I remind you there is a closing statement after this. Uh, this is my favorite question, too. Why should the Korean-American community vote for your party in the upcoming election on November 7th? 
and why should District 39 uh, at large uh, really? And how are you similar to or different from the gubernatorial candidate of your party? Uh, for this question, we're going to start with Senator Cardinale. Well, I believe there's too much emphasis on party and not enough emphasis on the policy that the party is proposing. Now, I support Kim Guadano for governor. And the reason I support her is because she has a plan to control property taxes, because she has a plan to oppose the $15 minimum wage, which will destroy small business, because she wants to keep our neighborhoods safe, safe for our residents, not safe for M13 and drug pushers. She wants to keep our cops, give them the benefit of the doubt, don't persecute the cops in favor of the criminal. I oppose forced excessive building, which increases traffic, it's environmentally unsound. The other candidate, he's all in favor of that. And if he gets elected, we will look like Brooklyn. I moved out of Brooklyn. Senator, I have to ask you to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Schrager. Oh. You should vote for us because we will be inclusive, not exclusive. I am tired of being lumped as the Democrats. The Democrats. And, and why would I not vote for Guadagno? Because I was a prosecutor in the courtroom where Governor Christie twice was uh, found probable cause for knowing what happened on the bridge and orchestrating it. And everybody sat back and some of the people here even said he had nothing to do with it, nothing to do with it. Um, Guadagno is a continuation of the lies of Christie. We need fresh faces. You need fresh ideas. You need new people. All night long they complained about what they need and what we're going to do if, oh my God, if we're elected because we're Democrats. Well, we're independent people. We're uh, good thinkers. We're not lumped as a group and have to follow the top. Thank you, and, um, Fresh ideas and faces. Why the Libertarian Party? Because in election after election, we are usually given a choice between a Democratic Party stuck in the 1930s and the 1960s and a Republican Party stuck in the 1950s and the 1980s. What the two old parties have in common is that they want to tax the people who don't vote for them so they can give the money to the people who do vote for them. Please note that of the top three parties, only the Libertarian Party is both pro-immigration and pro-free trade. These have been the backbone of America's success and prosperity, and we need both more than ever. If everybody who thought to themselves, I'd vote for that guy if I thought he could win, actually voted for me in a three-way race, I could win. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With all due respect to Mayor Schwager's comments, it's very tough to be independent when you've just accepted a quarter of a million dollars from the socialist pack. I didn't accept anything, your, if you'll notice. If you read the papers correctly. No, this came out today, so. Um, but with respect to why our party, our party is the party of opportunity. We are the party of working hard, being educated. We are not a party that just assumes that we're entitled to something. Work ethic, honor, honor and work is very important and an integral part. If you work hard, you succeed. We help you succeed. We don't want to take away from your small businesses. We want your children to be properly educated as every child should without special interest sending your money down to Camden and Asbury Park and other places. Our party is the only party fighting for the residents of Bergen County. There are 15 Democratic members of the legislature representing Bergen County. We are the only three that fight back against these policies. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. I don't advocate voting for a party. I advocate knowing your candidates and voting for the individual. I believe the three of us bring a fresh perspective. I believe things are not good in District 39, and we've had 
the same party for far too long. So in order to effectuate change, we need to change <coughs> leadership. Having said that, I do support our gubernatorial candidate, Ambassador Phil Murphy, although I don't agree with everything he says. And if elected, I won't be afraid to stand up to him for the things that are not good for our district that he may want to advocate for. However, I believe our party is great because they've given an opportunity and have fully supported to get the first Korean American state legislator into office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you. We are outlining problems with what Phil Murphy's proposing. He's proposed to raise the property taxes, 1.3 billion. He's proposed to fully fund the school funding formula. We discussed that tonight. He's proposed to increase transportation spending $3 billion. He's proposed free college, all along while saying they're going to reduce property taxes. The math doesn't add up. The difference between us is we're telling the truth, and they're dangling a carrot. I think New Jersey voters and I think District 39 voters are sophisticated enough to be able to separate vague promises that can't be produced without excessive taxes and ideas that will use austerity in budgeting to protect New Jersey taxpayers, specifically District 39 taxpayers. Thank you. Ms. Houseman. Um, so I agree with Janie. Um, I don't want you to vote for my party. I want you to vote for me. Um, if you know me, I don't, um, I don't take direction well if I don't believe in it. Um, why our party? Because the current leadership here has been in office over 50 years combined. We're $2.8 billion in debt. 87,000 jobs lost in the past five years. Property taxes are up 17%. Commuter costs are up 37%. Infrastructure is crumbling. It's a disaster. Um, we, the great thing about New Jersey is that we have figured out how to be inclusive, hopefully, right? We're a beautiful suburb next door to the largest melting pot of ethnicities and largest and most powerful business capital in the world. People should be flooding here, not fleeing here. We have every ingredient for success. We just need to sit down and have a conversation and work it out. Be grown-ups. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move into now closing statements in the last part of tonight's uh, forum. Uh, just as with uh, the opening statement, each candidate has 90 seconds to, uh, uh, to make their closing statement. Uh, we will start with Mayor Schweiger. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for putting up with me tonight with my <laughs> tissues. We love you. <laughs> uh, I would like to know where this money is coming from that, that uh, Assemblywoman Chapizzi keeps saying I have. Um, I'm going to go home and tell my husband. We have 274000 I have it on my phone for anybody who would like to I'd see like it. to read that. Yes, I definitely would. But now my statement. As I stated earlier, I have significant experience in government, in addition to currently serving as mayor for the second term and formerly serving as a three-term councilwoman. I also served on the planning board and board of adjustment. As your state senator, I will be your advocate. Unlike our current representative, I will serve all the residents of the district, not the political bosses in Trenton. I will not be a yes person to any governor, any speaker, anybody. I will promote economic growth. I will support tax credit initiatives, helping businesses grow and keeping corporations in New Jersey. School funding must be a priority to protect public education, to protect our children, and to protect us from increased taxes. Our sitting senator and assembly people have repeatedly supported Christie's agenda and Christie's activities. I want our voices in northern New Jersey heard in Trenton, making sure we get our fair share back for every dollar we send to Trenton. Thank you, Mayor. And it's uh, Kamsa uh, Habnida. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kassoum. 
What you heard tonight from the two old parties is more of the same, doubling down on failed policies. The hard, unpleasant truth is that without substantive program and spending reform to pensions, schools, and transportation, the only way to reduce taxes is to shift the burden to others or take on even more debt. Freezes, caps, and rebates, while better than nothing, are band-aids treating symptoms because politicians refuse to address the root cause of our tax burden. If you're happy with the two old parties' stewardship of the state over the past decades, and you believe their promises for the future, your choice is clear. If, however, you truly want change for the better, your choice is also clear. Let's give the two old parties a wake-up call. In a closely divided Senate, I could play a real role in putting the state on a path to fiscal health while otherwise leaving people alone to live their lives as they see fit. The politically homeless have a real choice in November. Column five, Libertarian Pete Rorman for governor and Jim Tassone for Senate. Thank you. Senator Cordinale. You might not know it from listening to this conversation. But Linda Schwager and I are friends. And we have worked together to benefit her town, together with my colleagues in the assembly, on one or another project that benefited the town. But we have different philosophies that we are supporting here tonight. And while they deny, and it's almost funny, while they deny their allegiance with Murphy and his weird ideas, they have accepted not 250,000. That's just the latest thing that they accepted. They've accepted probably around $800,000 in this campaign. That's obscene. I agree. Obscene. You see them on television. You see all their brochures. You see all these kids that they have out that they're not paying a lot of money to. And by the way, one of those kids got arrested for bringing drugs into one of our towns, bringing drugs into one of our towns where we have children, where we have, that's an absolute obscenity. They have not publicly rejected Murphy or his policies. If they did that, there might be some credibility toward their denial of supporting his policies, but they will support his policies, they are bought they are paid for. Thank you. Ms. Chong? Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for coming, but I want to especially thank my parents and all the first generation Koreans for being fearless and determined in giving me and someone like me an opportunity they never had. I'm sitting up here tonight running for assembly because of you, because of them. I'm running for office to represent all of the residents of the 39th district. But this year was a special year because I was able to include and engage a community that is often left out of political races. All the residents of the 39th have moved here for similar reasons to my family. Good schools, safe neighborhoods, and a strong community. However, I know many of you are struggling to stay in the homes you have spent your life savings to purchase. I will fight for you. I am ready to make hard decisions. It may not always be popular, and it may ruffle some feathers, but we can't afford anything else. I thank you for your time, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Thank you. I think um, while Ms. Chung's offered to fight for you and, and do all sorts of things for you that you feel that you may not have gotten to this point is naive. There has been 16 years of democratic control in the legislature, 16 years. And in this race, they want to add four more seats to have total dominance, veto proof control in case there's a Republican governor. She will not be able to be independent, individual, and she will not be able to defend values that are held by people in this room. The political bosses will tell her 
what she has to do. They will hand her a list of votes for the day and they will check off the answers for her when she gets them. That's not the way it works in our caucus, but that's the way it works in their caucus because if you defy them, you're out. And we've seen that time and time again in their inter-party squabbles where someone disobeys the leader and the next year he's gone. This is the facts. We see them all the time. 16 years of democratic control and this is what we have. But they're going to do better. I don't get it. I don't think you do either. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hausman. Thank you. Um, Kamsa Habnita. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I think we all want the same things, right? We want a good quality of life. We want people to have jobs. We want kids to do well in school and go on to have careers and hopefully come back here or go to school here. Um, you know, we are not in a good place in New Jersey. And, um, you know, that's mostly because of Christie's policies over the last eight years. Um, as you know, the governor in New Jersey has more power than any governor in the United States of America. He can veto anything, and he has done so repeatedly over the past eight years. The Democrats do not have a majority to be, a supermajority it's called. So um, I just wanted to clarify that because everyone is saying all these words, but you know, you deserve a representative that shows up to work, makes tough de decisions. I don't, I am not told what to do. It is not my style. Um, I will take each individual issue and look at it. I mean, that is my goal. I'm not there yet. I have never served as a politician. I've never been elected into office other than the PTO. But I want to do this. My youngest went off to college. I was going to put a for sale sign out, but I love it here and I want to stay. So I've decided to do this, and I hope I get your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Last time for the lobbyist, Mr. Beasy. Thank you for all being here this evening. Before I close, I just want to issue a challenge to my opponents. If they say that they have not accepted $242,817 from a PAC who will control them, I ask you to please renounce the money and give it back. But with respect to tonight, first off, Governor Christie can't set policy. All he can do is stop bad policy. It's been 16 years of democratic control, 16 years of regulation, 16 years of your property taxes skyrocketing, 16 years of businesses leaving. It's time to have Republicans in office. The policies that we've spoken about tonight, including some of the policies that my opponents endorse, the only person who has stopped it in the five years I've been in office is Speaker Vincent Prieto, the very man who is raising the money for our opponents to try to silence us and take us out because we are fighting against bad policy. We are fighting for you and the people we represent. We are you. We are the small business people. We are the ones working 15 hours a day for our children to have a better life. So if you want people who will fight for you, this is your team. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close, I would like to remind you to turn out uh, and vote on Tuesday, November 7th, which is less than two weeks. And I would also like to introduce you to the uh, inaugural Burning Town, the early voting day, which is going to be on Sunday, November 5th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, all registered uh, voters of Bergen County can show up to one Bergen County Plaza and cast your vote early on site. Uh, you can find more information on that. And uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, the Northern Valley Regional High School District for allowing us the space and all seven candidates for making the time in their busy schedule uh, on the Friday thank evening. You for as thank well you. as, of course, the audience. Uh, and thank you very much. And should you have any questions on the upcoming election or anything related to uh, uh, voting or election, you can always reach us on Facebook, on website, or call us at 847 Thank you very much.